Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Christine Leonard. I'm the director of the DC office for the Vera Institute of Justice. For those of you that may not be familiar with Vera, uh, we have a long 53-year uh, history as a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that does both research and policy work around criminal justice and immigration reform. As many of you know, working up here on Capitol Hill, the intersection of the federal leadership and uh, mandate around juvenile justice really is important in terms of how the states look at this issue. At the same time, there has been an incredible development of research over the last 10 years, and there's been an incredible amount of progress happening within the states. We still have a lot of challenges ahead, which our panelists will speak to today. But I have to tell you that this is really the key team uh, that you can look to as you have questions going forward. I'd like to first introduce Patty Pertz, who is the founder and executive director of the National Juvenile Defender Center. She has spent the last four decades of her career to improve the just, juvenile justice system. Prior to her appointment at NJDC, she directed the American Bar Association's Juvenile Justice Center for 10 years. She has focused specifically on ensuring that all children have access to competent counsel throughout their entire juvenile court process. In 2004, she was named by the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers as the champion of indigent defense, and she also received the 2007 Public Service Award from the Civil Rights Civil Liberties Law Review of Harvard Law School. And I will just say personally that when I was a staffer on the Senate Judiciary Committee, Patty very graciously took my calls, sometimes uh, very late in the afternoon with a very quick deadline, asking her very complicated questions as we were trying to figure out how to make sure that different legislative proposals that we were working on took into account the vast expertise that she has as well as the network of attorneys that she works with. So I'm delighted that she's here today and I hope that you um, also begin to have a long relationship with her. Uh, she is joined by Marsha Levick, who was here for our kickoff uh, back in September and has come back. And I'm delighted to introduce her to all of you again. She's the Deputy Director and Chief Counsel of the Juvenile Law Center in Philadelphia, which was founded in 1975. Marsha is a nationally recognized expert on juvenile law who has advocated for children's and women's rights throughout her legal career, including authoring articles on zero tolerance policies, girls in the juvenile justice system, and juveniles' rights to effective counsel. She has also successfully litigated challenges to unlawful policies and practices on behalf of children in both the juvenile and child welfare systems, most notably the Pennsylvania Juvenile Court Judges' Corruption in the Kids for Cash Scandal, which is a documentary film that I highly encourage you to see if you've not had the opportunity yet already. Marsha has also co-authored amicus briefs on the abolishment of the juvenile death penalty and banning of mandatory life sentences without parole for juveniles. She is really a deep expert in this subject matter and one that I hope will be a resource to all of you. In her spare time, which I don't know how she has any, she also serves on the boards of the Juvenile Justice Project of Louisiana, the Southern Poverty Law Center, and the Indiana University School of Public and Environmental Affairs. So thanks again for being here this morning, Marcia. Robert Mason is joining us here today from Florida. He is the Director of Juvenile Court for the Public Defender's Office in the Fourth Judicial Circuit. He has been an assistant public defender since 1990, practicing primarily in juvenile court. Among his many accomplishments, he has successfully argued in front of the Florida Supreme Court to help pass a rule opposing indiscriminate shackling of juveniles for court appearances, and successfully advocated for a court rule that children be warned of possible immigration consequences before the court accepts a plea. He has testified on juvenile issues before committees of the Florida House and Senate, as well as appeared nationally at various conferences. And in 2010, he was honored by the MacArthur Foundation as a Models for Change Champion of Change. So thank you for joining us this morning. And just to pause for a second um, to acknowledge uh, the incredible materials that we have for you outside from our panelists, including uh, an op-ed that was published uh, in the Washington Post this weekend by Patty Peretz, and uh, one that we do not yet have a copy of, uh, that Marsha will speak to that was published this morning in the New York Times. Um, so these issues are both timely, but also uh, gaining national media attention. Finally, let me introduce Kim Dvorak, who is the founder and executive director of the Colorado Juvenile Defender Coalition. She has represented youth in juvenile court, criminal court, and appellate court, specializing in the defense of children charged as adults. Prior to this role, she worked as a staff attorney in the Juvenile Defender Unit of the Legal Aid Society Criminal Defense Division in New York City. 
she's a frequent uh, presenter across the country, so we're very happy that it worked out for her schedule to be with us here today. Um, she's also been nationally recognized for her work in this area, and in 2009, she was awarded the Robert Shepard Jr. Leadership Award for Excellence in Juvenile Defense by the National Juvenile Defender Center. So again, I'd like to just thank all of our panelists for joining us this morning. They will give brief remarks so that we have time to engage uh, in any questions that many, any of you may have. So Patty, I'll turn it over to you. Sarah, do you mind me shutting the door? Thank you. Good morning. Is that better now? Can you hear me a little better? Yes. Thank you so much for joining us on this, uh, on this bleak day outside, but it is, it, there's sunshine in this room because we are very happy to be here. And I know I speak for my colleagues, uh, happy to talk about uh, our favorite subject, juvenile defense and the representation of children and a lawyer's role uh, in promoting youth justice. So I'm sure that we would all um, agree with that statement, that lawyers do have a vital and compelling role in promoting youth justice. But what I'd like to focus on just for a few minutes uh, in getting this conversation started is really the context and the environment in which they do that work. They have a, a very big, important job, and they have to do it under uh, difficult circumstances that I think are really important to understand. Then I want to speak briefly about some of the harm that comes when kids don't get access to counsel, that this is a, a very real and tangible harm that that we see young people and families suffering with. And then uh, really just to wrap up with uh, the ideas moving forward, that there are lots of solutions, there are tools, there are some new tested models, there are things that you might really be interested in learning more about that could uh, help move this issue forward. With respect to the, the right to counsel and the, the role of counsel in juvenile court, we know this is a constitutional right, nearly 50 years old, uh, that, that children have been given. But when you're out and about in the country and you're in different jurisdictions, it feels a lot more like an optional benefit that, are, that is afforded to some and not all. I would not say that there is even close to a uniform system in place across this country where kids are being given access to counsel in a, in a, in a logical, um, let alone developmentally based and sound uh, process. A lot of these bad habits sort of die hard. Uh, when this system was put in place, you'll remember, or, or perhaps I should mention, that the Galt case was decided right on the heels of Gideon. The focus was really on putting an adult indigent defense system in place. And I don't think we've ever really swung back as a country and in individual jurisdictions and communities to put that juvenile system together in a very intentional and thoughtful way. It was just sort of an add-on to a large adult system. And I think somewhere along the line, we have a lot of evidence that uh, people have forgotten that the indigent defense system in this country really serves two distinct classes of people, children and adults. And they need different things, and the services need to be delivered in different ways. When we're out around the country and we see the implementation of this right to counsel, we see that the infrastructure is, is lacking. Um, completely, that there is very little, except in certain places, real intentional focus on building these systems uh, properly. You see a uh, lot of problems on the front end around appointment of counsel and when that happens. We're very concerned as a country about the large number of children who proceed in court without counsel, who waive counsel. But how does that happen? How does the timing and appointment of counsel and the indigence determination of indigence impact this waiver of counsel problem? And then we see lots of problems on the tail end that are important for you to understand. We expect the lawyer to uh, help young people re-enter 
back into the community. There are so many things that need to occur as a young person is coming back into the community. But in most jurisdictions around this country, post-disposition representation, representing that child at the tail end of the system when they're still under the court's jurisdiction, virtually never happens. So the other piece that's important to understand when we talk about the lawyers that represent children, we speak as if there's one type of lawyer that's getting the training and the skills they need in law school to, to, do, to do this job. So you have to also think and subdivide that there are public defenders, and actually not many children get public defenders if you look at raw numbers across the country, um, but many do. Uh, there are other appointed counsel. Most kids get this type of lawyer that has a mixed practice, does juvenile, does adult, has a lot of other competing interests. There are law school clinical programs that pick up and, and provide service around these cases and do a, a great job, but in small numbers. And there are nonprofit law centers that do fantastic work with young people, but also from a different perspective, not as state employees, they have different sets of issues that they have to contend with. And we also have a lot of geographical differences all over the country. At NJDC, we study these systems. This is part of what we do. And I can tell you, just to sort of wrap this piece up, we see a lot of the same problems over and over again in state after state after state. But what we also see that, that uh, I hope will resonate with you, is that a lot of the solutions are really uniquely local. They've got to be, be embedded in a set of core elements and a philosophy that is shared, but the solutions are uniquely local. And there's so much more that we can and should be doing. My colleagues on this panel repre represent three states, Pennsylvania, Florida, Colorado, that have all done a lot of work uh, in reforming and rebuilding their juvenile defense systems and have a lot to share with you at this, on, on these matters. But basically, most juvenile defense systems in this country just suffer from an abundance of neglect. They just really haven't been looked at in detail. And this neglect comes at a price. To my second point briefly, there is harm. There is demonstrated clear harm when children don't get access to counsel don't understand the court proceedings, cannot adequately comply with court orders. Uh, the pr procedure goes past them very quickly. I don't know if any of you have had the occasion of being able to sit in juvenile court and observe these types of proceedings or look at some of these standard court orders that come out of these proceedings where there might be 25 conditions that are standard and another 10 that the judge judge adds on that this young person or family is supposed to understand uh, and comply with. You're going to learn a lot more in a few minutes about expungement and sealings and the, the harm that that causes to young people, uh, the collateral consequences that attach to these juvenile court adjudications uh, for a lifetime. And there is this perception that many young people and family have of these proceedings being a bit of a joke sham proceedings, a conveyor belt, in one door, out the other. And this uh, lack of perception of fairness really diminishes community trust and feeds things like what we've seen going on in Ferguson, that type of uh, discontent with the system around fairness and, and mistrust is not just a law enforcement issue. This is something we also see very much in juvenile courts where the state has an awful lot of power over your life and where you're going to go, where you're going to live. Um, but the most important point I'll make in closing uh, that I hope we can come back to is that these problems are not intractable. These problems in the juvenile court system and the juvenile defense system are things we can solve. And we've had the privilege of working on these things and uh, developing models and tools and testing them and need the opportunity to take some of this work to scale. But I think that these things exist uh, and that it's really important to take advantage of these things that are out there and we'd love to be able to share them with you. I hope that if you do 
one thing uh, leaving this session or want to think more about it that you will really take a look at your members indigent defense system what's going on in your congressional district just try to learn a little more and understand some of those component parts we have checklists and tools to help you do that if you're interested in uh, probing a bit uh, further on your own just let us know so we can help you do that Thank you. Good morning. Happy to be here this morning, and thank you all for coming. I also want to thank Vera for convening this extraordinary array of sessions that you have done. As Christine mentioned in introducing me, Juvenile Law Center was founded in 1975, about 40 years ago, and significantly, we were founded on the heels of In re Galt, which was decided in 1967, and that's the decision which afforded juveniles a constitutional right to counsel, decided four years after the U.S. Supreme Court decided Gideon. And so with our founding, we came into the field when there was barely a field. And we were very focused, particularly, I think, in establishing Juvenile Law Center, in thinking about what it meant to be a child and what it meant to have rights, most significantly, of course, the right to counsel, both in delinquency proceedings as well as in child welfare proceedings. And I think that one of the things that we have learned over and over again over the course of the last 40 years is what do you do when a right is not quite enough? So while we have this constitutional right to counsel that is now embedded and established through U.S. Supreme Court jurisprudence, clearly embedded in our Constitution, it's remarkable that 40 years later, nearly 45 years after, I guess 47 years after Galt was decided, we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of Galt, that we could still be having this conversation about what does it mean when we say that indigent people have a right to counsel, and what does it mean when we talk about a right to appointed counsel for children. It turns out that that right remains rather elusive, and it remains elusive, I think, on a number of levels. Patty talked about just the variety that we see around the country. We arguably have 50 state juvenile justice systems. Juvenile justice is largely a creation of state law. There is certainly a key room for federal leadership. And JJDPA has certainly provided us with key leadership in terms of establishing national mandates. But essentially, it's a state-run system. Within each of those 50 states, we have multiple systems of indigent defense. In a state like Pennsylvania, where Juvenile Law Center is based, we may have about a half of the state. Uh, we have 67 counties in the state where we have public defender offices. In the other half of those counties, we have a court-appointed counsel system. So even within the 50 states, there's a remarkable lack of uniformity. And really what that leads to is this extraordinary lack of uniformity in the quality, effectiveness, and uh, value that indigent defense lawyers can bring to the system and that they can provide for kids. In Pennsylvania, uh, we were obviously uh, the home of the Kids for Cash scandal. Uh, if you don't know about it, I suspect you do know that there were a couple of judges in Pennsylvania who were uh, indicted criminally for receiving about almost $3 million in illegal funds from the private not-for-profit provider uh, who built and was operating juvenile detention centers. Those two judges eventually went to prison. They're now serving 17 and 28-year sentences in federal prisons. The documentary, which some of you may have seen, is, is very much in some sense about the criminal conduct that the judges engaged in. But as someone who has participated and been a part of that story, been to many screenings and been on many panels that have talked about the aftermath and the inside story of what was happening in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania, in the northeastern part of the state, one of the things that I always say is that for me, the story was never about the money. That for me, for my colleagues at Juvenile Law Center, what happened in Luzerne County was really about a failure of the justice system. And it was very much about a failure of the public defense system in Luzerne County. You had a situation there where for a period of five years that we were able to closely observe and quantify what happened to kids. 
more than half of the kids appeared in front of the juvenile court judge in Luzerne County without lawyers. That's a shocking number. Again, remember, the right to counsel was established in 1967 for kids. When we first became aware of what was happening in Luzerne County, it was in 2007. So 40 years after children were allegedly afforded a constitutional right to counsel, it turned out that more than half of them in one town in Luzerne, in, up in northeastern Pennsylvania, weren't appearing without lawyers at all. And while that was the Pennsylvania story, we know, because of the conversations that we've had with colleagues, including colleagues right here in Colorado and in Florida, that that story wasn't unique to Pennsylvania, that the very high rates at which children were appearing, still appearing, in front of juvenile court judges without lawyers is a, a number that often exceeds 50%. Uh, it has been, I know in Colorado you have counties where it's over 60%, and it's really important to ask ourselves, how can this be happening, and how can we allow this to happen? And I think that another part of the story is also, and I think Patty alluded to this somewhat in her remarks, is that there is a, um, there's a kind of complacency that I think takes over in the juvenile justice system. I suspect it occurs in the criminal justice system as well. And that complacency is a tolerance for allowing the process of justice to carry on and proceed in a way that really meets out much more injustice than justice. Uh, Amy Bach, who is a lawyer and author, wrote a book called Ordinary Injustice. It's actually about the criminal justice system, uh, a couple of defenders that she was actually following in Georgia. And she talks about this notion of ordinary injustice really being about a process whereby the participants in what's going on in the courtroom and the violations of rights that go on every day in the courtroom are so enmeshed in that system that they no longer see their role in it. And I think that that's a lot of what we see with the, the universe of the indigent defense world in, in the United States, that there is this inability, uh, it appears at times, to really see their role in what's going on. We certainly saw this in Luzerne County, where when our first call, when we realized that something was amiss in Luzerne County, we knew the story of one young girl who had appeared in front of one of the judges without a lawyer, had a 90-second hearing, had none of her due process rights protected in terms of being even allowed to waive counsel in a constitutional way, and I'll come back to that issue in a minute, pleading guilty to a charge with no colloquy that would be required, meaning where she is being asked to demonstrate on the record that she understands what she's pleading guilty to and she understands the, right that she's, the rights that she's giving up. None of this was afforded to her, and then she was let out of the courtroom in handcuffs and shackles. That was the picture of what was going on almost every day in Luzerne County, and yet the public defender's response when we contacted them and sought their assistance in trying to understand the scope of the problem in Luzerne County to begin our process of trying to fix what had happened there. The public defender, defender's response was that they weren't interested in working with us. Um, because for them, this was a job. Uh, the judge was the person before whom they appeared every day, and if they began to shake up and speak out about what was happening in Luzerne County, there was both a personal price in terms of their job security and a concern about what might happen to their clients, although, of course, we can all today recognize it couldn't possibly have been worse. Um, but that's something, that's a kind of institutional complacency that we all know happens in our ranks every day and something that we need to fight against. When we think about consequences, what happens when kids don't have lawyers is that at a minimum, of course, they're not trying their own cases. It means that they are all pleading guilty to charges of delinquency. And when you plead guilty to a charge of delinquency, there is a myth in this country that delinquency records are confidential. And at one time, we did think and endeavor to keep the juvenile court a behind closed doors, not very transparent, but also private set of proceedings where we were protecting kids from the consequences of their criminal behavior that they were engaged in as juveniles. That was the original dream and purpose of the juvenile court. That dream has long faded. And through the course of the last 20 or 30 years, 
we've seen extraordinary changes in the juvenile justice system where it has become far more punitive, far more interested in imposing in accountability, uh, which we favor, but we favor imposing that accountability in a developmentally appropriate way, not in a punitive way in the same, day, same way that we hold adults responsible. But the consequence of that movement towards accountability is that we have also opened up juvenile records. And when you open juvenile records to public consumption, when you make them available to the community at large, when you make them searchable and accessible by employers, by higher education universities and institutions, by housing authorities, public housing authorities, what you do is you suddenly create obstacles and barriers and you shut down the ability of many kids who have received delinquency adjudications, albeit behind those closed doors in this so-called not punitive system, it turns out that we erect barriers to their abilities to get jobs, to get public housing, to get higher education loans, all because of conduct that in many instances was minor. I mean, one of the statistics that I hope you all carry around with you is that 95% of the kids who are adjudicated delinquent in the juvenile justice system in this country have been adjudicated delinquent for nonviolent offenses, 95% of them. And yet we are allowing these records to follow them and to create extraordinary barriers. I'll end with just a reference to a report that we just released in the New York Times editorial today. Juvenile Law Center last week released a 50-state scorecard on the expungement, sealing, and confidentiality policies of all 50 states in the District of Columbia. And the idea behind it was to look at, just as NJDC has been very involved in educating us all about what indigent defense systems look like across the country, what we wanted to know was how well do states do at fulfilling the promise of juvenile court being a second chances court, of not saddling kids with the kinds of ball and chain that really prohibit them from moving forward with their lives once they exit that system. Well, it turns out we do poorly. Uh, it turns out that we used a five-star scoring method, five stars being the highest. Not a single state got five stars. Idaho across the board was the worst state. Uh, in the country, but the vast majority of the states were in the three-star or two-star category. So that means that we are not doing a good job about ensuring the confidentiality of records, and we're not doing a very good job about eliminating barriers. We are, in fact, erecting barriers to kids being able to move forward. Um, so in the New York Times this morning, there is an editorial uh, that specifically references the report that we did. Our report is available on our website at jlc.org. All of the materials are, in fact, web-based. I urge you to take a look at them. Uh, they are pieces of legislation that has been introduced in the Booker-Paul bill, uh, the Redeem Act, where there is a, a specific section in there that is dealing with expungement. Uh, it's relevant to My Brother's Keeper. This is, if we don't give kids an opportunity to move past their juvenile records, the right to counsel actually doesn't even mean that much because the right to counsel is critical to allowing children to enforce all other rights that they have, and they have a panoply of due process protections that our Constitution affords them. But that right to counsel also will be most meaningful if in providing for prote protection for kids within the juvenile justice system, we are also mindful of what happens when they exit that system. Thank you, Marcia. And Rob, before we turn to you, I just wanted to add a few comments. One is the, the REDEEM Act that Marcia mentioned had a house, has a House companion, this Congress, uh, led by Congressman Frank Wolf, uh, uh, the Republican chair of the uh, Appropriations Subcommittee on uh, Commerce, Science, and Justice. However, <clears throat> he is retiring, and so uh, it's unclear what will happen in the next Congress, but we do expect that uh, the bill will be re reintroduced in both chambers. I'd also just encourage you uh, to, to read the clip that uh, Marsha mentioned in the New York Times this morning, as well as one that is in the Washington Post today, um, led by the Marshall Project, a new effort um, to do more uh, reporting around criminal justice issues. And it just, it really resonates uh, the issues that both Patty and Marsha have touched upon already, and I think that Rob and Kim will say more about, is that we're not just talking about 
um, whether or not there's a lawyer in the room to represent the young person who may be facing court for the first time in their life, which in and of itself would more likely uh, be the most terrifying experience that they've ever had with or without their parents, but also the competency of the lawyers that are with them. In the Marshall Project's effort, which is highlighted in the post this morning, the headline is, when lawyers stumble, only their clients fall. And it talks about an unrelated issue to this morning's discussion, which is about lawyers missing filing deadlines and the impact that it's had on death row cases and the number of executions that have taken place merely because the lawyers miscalculated the filing deadlines and in some instances filed a day late or worse, chose to send their clients um, paperwork by regular mail rather than FedEx, thus missing the court filing deadline. And these stories are real. They have draconian consequences for the clients who are facing them. Uh, these incredible circumstances. And so I think it just again underscores that we're talking about you know things here today that aren't just about um, the justice system and how it is, it is constitutionally supposed to work, but what are these real life consequences for the people who are facing it? And, and, and to be fair, I mean, I think as, as Marsha mentioned, I mean, these are non-filing cases, but you, know, you also have to think about someone going into this situation for the first time in their life whether or not they have a lawyer in the family. I mean, most people have not, you know, until they're in the system for the first time, they're kind of, they're learning it as they're going through the process. So, Rob, I'm so glad you're here with us, and I hope you can speak to a bit your experience in Florida, not only in your current role, but maybe highlight for us um, some of the, what, what happens in the situations where the kids don't get, have contact with your office, or if they didn't meet you. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for being here, and Christine, thank you for inviting me. Um, my name is Rob Mason. I've been a PD public defender for 25 years. Before that, I was a bicycle messenger in New York City for five years. I bring that up um, not to emphasize the point that I get beat up all the time, but as a bicycle messenger, you have to be on your A game. If you're not on your A game, you get run over. When you're an attorney that represents children, you have to be on your A game. You don't, if you're not on your A game, the kids get run over. They don't have a lawyer, they get run over. So it's really very significant. Um, there's terrible consequences. Marcia was talking about the records, but the terrible consequences to children when they get in trouble. You know, I grew up and we heard about, oh, this will be on your permanent record. I really never understood what that meant until I started representing juveniles and seeing how they were affected by this permanent record. Uh, 44 years ago, when I was a 12-year-old kid, um, thank God I lived in a society that was not such an arrest-happy society. Because my sister and I thought it would be a really good idea to sneak down to the maintenance um, place with the golf carts and get in a golf cart and, and take a little outing. And uh, we got a, in trouble for that in the sense that we got caught, but we didn't get arrested. But now kids get arrested, and I represent them in, on cases like that. You know, we weren't criminals. We were a couple of boneheaded kids. It's, our brains were still developing. Um, but it, it's different. It's different now. And the, the kids in juvenile court, um, it's a different language. I can understand why the children don't really get it. I can understand why the parents don't get it. I can understand why some private attorneys that come in don't get it, because it's a different language and there's much more complex dynamics. Now, I've been exclusively juvenile since 1999. I had a year and a half before that, starting in 1990. I find these cases more complex and the dynamics more intellectually stimulating than my time spent in repeat offender court or my time spent in special defense. So when we talk about kids, we know that kids need lawyers, kid need, kids need effective lawyers, kid needs, kids need effective lawyers with very specialized knowledge and specialized training. The, you've heard some about the different systems that we have in the different states and even in the same states, the different offices. So much of the practice is just in silos. So much of the practice is, this is Judge Kim, she's been here forever. This is me, I've been here forever, and we'll just keep doing it this way, even though it might not be the right way 
to do it. Um, that's why we, we need to have standards. We need to, to fill these gaps with training and information. Uh, standards will help elevate the practice. They'll bring consistency to the process. Again, we want a child who steals a car in Nebraska to be dealt with in the same in overall encompassing way as any other location. We don't want justice by geography. And sometimes there is justice by geography for a number of reasons. Sometimes there's just not enough specialized um, knowledge that's been brought to the attorneys. So you have some children that don't have attorneys, and that's terrible, and then you have children with attorneys that don't have enough training. That's terrible. And one of the problems is, in, in my office and the offices I've seen around the state and the offices I've seen around the country, is it's a very adult-focused adult focused practice. And Patty had, had talked some about this, of thinking of the two systems with children and adults. Uh, kids get shortchanged in, in the defender's offices. Um, it, it's a mentality of this is just kitty court. This, this doesn't really matter as much. And that perception extends. It's, you know, I, I, I'm very critical of the public defender's office in the Kids for Cash documentary um, for what they did. Um, but I'm, I'm critical of all public defender's offices for allowing that perception to continue. And it goes through the whole criminal justice perception. So the judges feel that way. The prosecutors feel that way. And the result is the system starts to break down. And we don't have the resource parity. We don't have personnel parity. And because of it, we don't, we're not able to secure competent or diligent representation. So, so what happens if, if we have children in court that don't have this competent and diligent representation? Well, they might, if they get a lawyer, I mean, first we have to get to that, but, but let's say that they do have a lawyer, but the, that particular defender might not really even understand the signif significance of the other kids in the courtroom that don't get lawyers. They might just accept it. They may not want to battle with their office. Uh, that defender also, without having the, the standards and the training they need, they may not object to the indiscriminate shackling. And again, it was an excellent article by uh, Patty in, in the Post the other day. Um, I had the pleasure of arguing it in front of the Florida Supreme Court, and uh, I started with if convicted adult murderer Carmen L. Deck is entitled to appear before the court with the rebuttable pre presumption not to be shackled, shouldn't our children have that same right? And when you think about it, it's, it's really amazing that, that we sometimes have that, that standard. Um, again, the, the defenders may not know how to successfully present mitigation to keep a kid in juvenile court when the prosecutors are thinking of prosecuting the child as an adult. Or in, in my state, where prosecutors have unbridled discretion to make that decision and, and do it by their choice, that defender may not have the knowledge to develop the mitigation or may not have the specialized knowledge to work with that mitigation and negotiate the case and do things to keep it in juvenile court. Additionally, if the case goes up to the adult court, uh, each state's going to be different, but in, in, in most of my state, the way the statute is written, if a child is prosecuted as an adult, the child most likely will be in the big boy jail, will not be in the detention center. Uh, a lot of times when they're in the adult facilities, they may be in isolation and confinement, not necessarily for acting up, but to keep them away from the other adults. Again, the defender may not know that. May, defender may not know to challenge that. Uh, the defender may be in a position where they don't know that they have an excessive caseload. They may not understand that they have too many cases to adequately re represent everyone. And their supervisor may not know. 
it's, it's, a, it's a very significant problem. Uh, the defender may not be familiar with the appellate process, uh, not understanding, or may not even have the, the resources. And most significantly, defender may not know the ins and outs of juvenile sex offender registration, which is pretty much the juvenile death penalty. These are all very specific um, and incredibly harmful um, actions that the prosecutor sometime will take on children. So effective advocacy helps save the children. It saves money. Um, it, it's a cost savings. Um, the, some of the issues are the children that when they have records or when they have these collateral consequences, they have housing issues, employment issues, college issues, military issues. Um, and and I'll, I'll close by looking at, you know, kids for cash is, is a tragedy, you know, but it is an extreme. Um, the problems we're talking about are more, are also tragedies, and they're not the extreme. They're what we have throughout the country now. Um, anytime there's a lack of due process, that's a tragedy. And that's, it's not just a tragedy for the child, it's a tragedy for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And I would just add, you know, we've, Kids for Cash has come up a number of times, and I would agree with you that it is an extreme uh, situation and that it was documented that the judges were accepting bribes as part of what was going on in the court. But uh, not to give too much of the film away, I mean, it is very impactful to hear the judges uh, participating in the film say that especially one of them would have done it without the money um, and, and was doing it before the money was involved. And we uh, are also inviting in a couple of weeks, and we would be happy to include uh, anyone who's interested to have a conversation with um, an author, Bill Eckenberger, who also wrote a book about the is issues that came up in Pennsylvania, also called Kids for Cash. And both in the film and in the book, one of the things that comes up quite a bit is the impact and the trauma that the young people experience as a result of the shackling. And, and, and what's noted in the book is that the shacklings that are used in this county in Pennsylvania are produced by the same manufacturers who produced the shackles that were used for slaves here in this country back in that period of our history. So to think about that and to think, you know, even in the last few months prior to Patty's article in the Post, there was another article in the Washington Post about how here in D.C., children as young as eight years old have been shackled in the courtrooms just a few blocks from here. And it's very hard for me to understand, even as a parent of young, uh, very active boys, why there would be any situation in any courtroom in this country where a child that young would have to go through that kind of experience. So, and again, this is a side issue in some ways because what we're really talking about here today is if, if there's a lawyer there, hopefully they would intervene. But I think as all our panelists thus far have mentioned, the, the, the lawyer, frankly, may not even know whether or not they can bring up the issue of the use of shackles. That's how, how horrible the situation is right now in terms of the lack of uniform standards and training across the country. So with that, we'll turn it over to Kim, who has some uplifting uh, comments for us about what's been happening in Colorado and the progress they've been making there. Well, thank you, Christine. Thank you to the Vera Institute for inviting me to join this very esteemed panel uh, and to all of you for being here on a rainy day in Washington, D.C. I come from the great state of Colorado, a modern innovator in many fields. We actually have a statewide juvenile, a statewide, excuse me, public defender system, and we've had it since 1970. It's very well funded, uh, the lawyers are very well trained, but I can tell you that when I started my legal career there, the last place I wanted to be assigned was in juvenile court. Juvenile court was a rotation sandwiched between representing adults on misdemeanor cases and representing adults on felony cases. Rotating out of juvenile court was a promotion. It meant you had the skill, expertise, and readiness to defend adults accused of serious crimes. And it meant an increase in pay. So I certainly um, take great uh, concern over my lack of representation for children at the early stages of my career. Even though Colorado was the second state to start a separate juvenile court system, over time, especially through the 90s and into the current century, we chipped away at due process rights for children. We took away the right to a jury trial in Colorado. 
We lost representation for children at early proceedings. We made it easier to prosecute children as adults. We started prosecuting children in the juvenile courts for minor misconduct. And so we at the, National, at the Colorado Juvenile Defender Coalition asked the National Juvenile Defender Center to come to Colorado. And we asked our courts to invite the National Juvenile Defender Center to come to Colorado. We knew there was a lack of representation for children at detention hearings. And the National Juvenile Defender Center came out, they did an incredible thorough state assessment of Colorado and found that indeed, we were suffering from benign neglect. That while there were a lot of resources invested in our defender system, there's a lot of resources invested in treatment for children, there was not a lot of resource or emphasis around due process and fundamental rights for children. My organization followed the NJDC assessment with our own study of Colorado courts. We released a report called Kids Without Counsel. And we too went into the juvenile courts across our state to take witness of what was happening. And what we found was that at the earliest proceedings, children were not represented by lawyers. So at the detention hearing, which is the first hearing where a child is coming in from being arrested, they're in a jumpsuit, they're shackled, they're appearing before a judge in many places in our state without a lawyer. Now this is a judge who is deciding whether or not a child should go home or remain locked up in custody and there is no advocate to represent them. It's been estimated that 2,000 children a year in Colorado were unrepresented at these very early stage proceedings. For the children who are not arrested, who are given a summons and appearing in on a ticket, they were in what was called a first appearance court. Now those court dates were scheduled on days when the public defender was not present. So there were public defender days, there were court appointed counsel days, and then there were just no counsel days on the record. And children and families were coming in 20, 30, 40 people at a time. It was the prosecutor who was passing out plea paperwork. The prosecutor was passing out plea agreements. They would pass them out to everyone in the room, let them know they're welcome to hire a lawyer, they're welcome to apply for the public defender, but all of that would require them coming back on another court date. But if they'd rather take care of the case today, here's the plea agreement we're offering and you can resolve this right now and walk out. Now, these parents and children did not know what that meant. They did not know what pleading guilty would mean for their long-term consequences. There was no one to advise them whether this would impact you know, their housing, their ability to get into college, even their high school sports can be at jeopardy from a juvenile adjudication. So we brought this information from the National Juvenile Defender Center from our own assessment to Colorado, and our citizens were shocked to hear that for over a decade, 40 to 50% of all children statewide were not represented by counsel in juvenile delinquency proceedings. So our state legislators took leadership and they put together an interim committee to study juvenile defense. This was a legislative committee that met over the interim. We studied the scope of appointment of counsel, practice standards, how our indigent defense systems were run. All of these materials are publicly available on the Colorado General Assembly website. And if you're interested, I would encourage you to take a look at all of the rich resources and materials that were gathered there. I am proud to say that three bills came out of that committee and they were passed in our 2014 legislative session. And as of November 1, just a few weeks ago, all children in Colorado must be represented by an attorney at the detention hearing phase. Um, we were resourced additional lawyers for the public defender system to provide for that representation. And we also changed our system at the earliest stages so that when a child is given a ticket, the ticket actually says, this is how you apply for the public defender. This is where the office is located. If you apply for the public defender at least five days before your court date, one will be there in court if you are eligible. We also changed our waiver of counsel provisions so that before a child can waive counsel, the judge is required to review all of the collateral consequences of what pleading guilty will mean for that child. 
Um, so it is still the early stages of reform in Colorado. We need to do considerable amount of work, particularly around indigence determinations. Our state uses federal poverty guidelines to decide whether or not someone is eligible for a public defender. Um, and while that might be used in other contexts to determine someone's ability to buy food or other basic needs, uh, it is not a very good indicator of a parent's ability to hire a private attorney at anywhere from one to two to three hundred dollars an hour for their child in juvenile court. So additional work must be done to ensure that more children are represented by counsel given the long-term collateral consequences. But I'm also proud that we have we are seeing a change in culture in our public defender system. I recently presented at an event with a local public defender and she said that in her tenure this was the most exciting time to be a juvenile defender in our state public defender's office. Um, so I am very proud to see that the culture is shifting, that kids are getting better representation, and that resources are being spent for children because we all hope that if we intervene there with our young people, if we can reduce the criminalization and the long-term impact on their lives, that they won't go on to become defendants in our adult criminal justice system. So thank you very much for being here and I'm happy to provide any more information about the Colorado process and the resources we put together. Thank you.